Hey fellow UX designers and researchers, do you want to learn the basics of UX design? Well, today I will share with you an introduction lecture to UX design that I taught to students at the University of Waterloo. In this lecture, I go over how I run this course, what books I recommend, what assignments students have to do, what topics I cover in the classes, and how they work together in a group project. I then give them an icebreaker exercise to provide an introduction to UX design. And then as part of this introduction to UX design, I talk about the main components of usability, how UX turned LEGO around, why UX design is vital for designing products, how UX can potentially kill people, and why it's important for airplane pilots, and what value it brings to companies and what the role of UX designers is in those companies. I introduce the concept of the Norman door, discuss the meanings of UX and why it's problematic with pointers to both Norman and Nielsen. Finally, I dive into the intricacies of UX versus UI what the qualities of a good UX designer are and how to conduct UX design sprints. We round off the lecture with a discussion of Nielsen's 10 heuristics. I hope you enjoy this lecture. If you do, I would only like to ask you for one thing to support my channel, which is by subscribing to it. You have no idea how much that helps me do these videos in many different ways. So like and subscribe and see you in the next video. I appreciate your support. Welcome everyone. Hello. Welcome to this class on introduction to user experience design. The class is called user experience design, but it's an introductory class. So Today, I'm going to give you an introduction to the introduction to UX design. So it's inception, double introduction. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit about who I am because most of you don't know me, probably haven't taken a class with me yet in a second. Just as we're getting started, for those of you that are wondering what all this is, this actually is being recorded for archival purposes. We made public on YouTube. More information on the notes of recording is available in your syllabus. Feel free to check that. Let me know if you got any reservations or anything else. It's just recording me. It's not recording your faces or anything. So it's just archival. It's actually beneficial for you. You can go through the lectures after the fact in case you ever miss anything you're able to catch up that way it's part of an experiment that i'm doing with social media where i'm building in public so both of my classes i'm teaching also a dvd class also on user experience design but that's an advanced class for which i'm also having guest lectures so if you need to do that it's all on my youtube channel so if you want to like go beyond the regular classroom you can find that in there before i start i'd like to be in this class and that's all of our classes in the future by acknowledging that the university of waterloo sits on the traditional territory of the atavandaran neutral anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Now our main campus is situated on the Haldeman track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. And we're situated on this additional territory, which is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. And our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, teaching, learning, and community building, and is coordinated with our Office of Indigenous Relations. So who am I? My name is Dr. Nanaka, and today I want to go over the syllabus and give you a short introduction to this course. But before we dive deeper into today's topic, I think it makes sense to let you know a little bit about what my background is, what I'm bringing to this class. I run a world leading research group, it's called the HCI Games Group, at the Games Institute specifically at the University of Waterloo. I'm proud to say that I'm among the top 2% of most cited scientists in the world. In fact, I've been recognized as one of the top 20 most influential scholars in human computer interaction over the last decade. But I won't let that go to my head because I still suck at playing Fortnite. So, I live in the beautiful city of Waterloo, here. Actually, not too far from here. I can walk, not on days like this though. I've also had the privilege of being the editor of a best-selling book. It's called the Games User Research Book. It's called Games User Research, which is a comprehensive guide for anyone interested in game UX and field of games. I also run a podcast based on that together with my co-editors. We're we'll publishing once a month episodes that are filling up some of the things that we couldn't cover in the book. In my professional life, I'm a full tenured professor. The number of tenured faculty has declined to about 21%, so I'm really glad to be one of them. And it allows me to deeper investigate in my studies and share my knowledge with the next generations of scientists and researchers. I'm also quite active on social media, as I just mentioned, particularly on Twitter and LinkedIn, where I actually update insights and engage in discussions every day. I tend to curate a lot of content there. I also write a bi-weekly game series newsletter. If anyone's interested in that, it's called the Academic Tip Tuesday. It's run by the Moniker Academic Online, which is academic and games. Okay, so it's packed with useful tips and insights about user experience and games. If anyone's interested, you can find that online as well. In this class, as we will see in one of the other slides, the best way to contact me is through MS Teams. So it's Microsoft Teams. For those of you who haven't seen this yet, there is an installation that comes with this course. Please double check there as I will do in all of my communication through MS Teams, specifically through the Ask the Instructor channel. And I'll talk about that in a second. So this is exactly where that channel is located. Ask the Instructor. Team is called Back to your 9, Paul 20. And this is the best way to contact me. 
only if you have large and complex requests uh, that you want to paper trail on, uh, then I require an email. So if it's anything job related or anything where you want to file a grievance or something like more grave nature, then by all means do that via email. If it's anything that's just relating to regular in-class communications, I much prefer if that's done via a team's direct message. So just casual communication. Okay. So for any questions, we're only two sides in, so probably not. Everyone's still with me? Good. Okay. So what's in this course? So in this course, I want us to understand UX design principles, UX design methods, and specifically methods like the following. User-centered design. We'll actually talk about what the problem with user-centered design is and with a lot of terminology in UX, because there is a lack of clarity, you could say, in recent years. So people that are encountering terms like human for unit action, interaction design, user-centered design, UX, and are kind of lost, trust me, you know, the only one. We'll talk about that today, specifically. And we'll talk about prototyping, not today, but in this class, personas and testing. Those are the core ideas that this course is built upon. Now, I do provide a lot of information in my course slides, in the learn installation, as well as, like I said, with the adjacent YouTube videos and things like that. So there'll be lots of external links where you can go in depth if you're really interested in the topic. However, I do always get questions at the beginning of every class. Isn't there a book that we can read? Now, I don't require you to read a specific book for this class, but here's a list of recommended books that I actually really enjoy reading myself. And that if you're interested in UX design, that you might find interesting as well for yourself. And if you want to read kind these slides, I've already uploaded them and learned, and you can get all of that information there right away. So be, be aware that you can get all of that stuff. So the design of everyday things is one of them. And then Steve Crook, don't make me think that I revisited the newer edition. Are the two books that I really recommend for this class. They're really kind of embracing a lot of the stuff that we talk about. They're also really great books if you actually want to get into your ex design. Some of you might have already come across them. These two books are not as relevant to this class, they're more relevant to your research classes that I teach, but I do recommend if you're interested in the nitty gritty of research, I do recommend you to check them out as well. The really nice overview book, few books for those of you that really feel like research uh, is more of your passion than design. Now, of course, we're covering both, but we're focusing specifically on design in this class. So in terms of course goals and learning outcomes, one of the ideas that we have here is that we want to analyze and apply user-centered design principles. And now this language is of course coming from the syllabus, it's coming from the calendar entries. And one of the things that you probably already know is user-centered design is again, the, the question is what is it, right? Like you will define it in this class so that you actually know what we mean by that. So a design process that focuses on the user. And then to create personas, user journey maps and prototypes, we'll do a lot of that as we go through this class and we'll conduct usability tests and interpret the results. And of course, you learn how to collaborate effectively. Now, this is part of your minor, this is part of your classes in general, uh, but also in this class, there is a lot of group work attached to it. So it's a very collaborative environment um, in a team so that you can produce a UX design project together. Which brings us to the idea of how is this course assessed and how are your grades being developed? So this is my idea of course assessment. And here you can see the breakdown. And again, keep in mind, if you want the details of this, this is just the overview slides. There are much more, there's much more detailed information in Learn, in the syllabus. And I know that this is a little bit of a, of a joke that we have sometimes that we say, you know, it's in the syllabus, profs have like t-shirts which says, did you read the syllabus? It's actually a thing. Like we do want you to read the syllabus because we do put a lot of really relevant information in there. So by all means, check that online if you can this week and you'll find all those details. Okay, so the first, Assessment piece that we have here is assignments. There's a total of three assignments. I'll talk about that in a second. They're weighted at 30%. Then we have UX mini challenges. Again, I'll talk about that in a second, what that means. We got use UX flashback frenzies. So those are quite fun at the end of each class. And then we got a big group project, which is also broken down, down in some sub presentations. But let's go through each of these uh, so that you have an idea of what they all mean. So first of all, we have the assignments. Assignments are a total of three assignments. Those are done individually by each of you. They're not done as a group. They're individual assignments that you do at home. Think of it like homework. We'll be releasing the first assignment this week. So you'll have it uh, ready probably by Friday. It'll be released this week. These three assignments, you have about, I'd say, two to three weeks to finish them. And 
each assignment is worth 10%, so that you have a total of 30% coming in from assignments, individual assignments. Each is worth 10%, and each is due not at 1 p.m. I was thinking at 1 p.m., but I think I actually decided I'm going to make them do it. Actually, I'd like your feedback on that. So I was thinking I'll make them do the night before because in the past years, I have that feedback from students that they always like a, a deadline because that's how most people do it, I think, in DAC. Uh, is this the case for this class? Do you prefer like an end of day deadline? Then I will make it due on the Monday before. So it'll be, it'll be due Monday night. It won't be due right before class. Because I feel like for some people that doesn't matter because you all get class for lots of you that other classes in the morning just adds extra pressure. So we'll make it due at the end of the day before. Okay. So it'll all be due by midnight that day. All right. Any questions so far about assignments, individual assignments? Then we have mini challenges. Now, mini challenges are things that we're actually doing in class. This is part of the reason why you want to attend class because overall you have six mini challenges to complete. So that is during six lectures, there'll be six mini challenges. Each is a 60 minute in-class group activity. You get a taste of what that could be like. We have an icebreaker activity today. Now that's not a UX mini challenge, but it gives you a taste of how these really mini challenges could feel like. Okay, so you have an idea already after today's class. They're in total are worth 20%. Now, here's where we get a little bit mathematical. So if they're worth 20%, how many of these mini challenges do you think you need to actually complete to get a grade of 100%? Good guess. Whoops. Four. Four, and then they each would be worth how much? Five percent. You hit the nail on the head. I could have, you know, calculated it differently, but this is exactly how I went with. So that means you're doing. You have two extra exercises. So what are we doing for the assessment here? If you're doing the total of the six year mini challenges, I will pick the four best ones and give you that grade. Okay. So I will drop the lowest two grades that you have in these. And if you miss two, that's also fine, no problem. You'll just get graded for the four best ones. So that's what you got to know about the UX mini challenges to get that 20% of your grade. Any questions about that so far? And they're in person, so they have to be done in the class. Flashback families also happens in class. Flashback families are also individual, in-person exercises. It's pretty much two questions at the end of each class. And it's totally old school because we're doing it on paper. Why on paper, Leonard? Because of chat GPT, right? Because I do have a policy about AI-generated content. I actually wanted to use AI-generated content. I'm a big fan of it. I use it every day in all of my work. I think it's fantastic, but it needs to be declared. It needs to be done properly. And some of the things we want to do in class wouldn't just be too easy because you could, in theory, just upload the PDF and then with askyourpdf.com, you could just twist the PDF for the question and you would just have the answer right there. So it's supposed to happen at the end of each class. After you've taken in all the information, I'll give you five minutes, really easy questions about the stuff that we've talked about, and you just quickly give the answer, we collect them, and then you get graded off right away. Okay, that is the flashback friendly. And as you can see here, worth 10%, but if we have, I think I've got to go back this slide so that you see this again. So if we have, oh no, I don't have the number in there. So if we have 12 classes overall, if you subtract the reading week, we have 12 classes overall. If we do a flashback friendly these stuff, that's 12 flashback friendlies. Okay, so how do you think we're going to get to 10 percent to the word of exactly the drop two, right? That's the idea so far. So you can pretty much miss the class. Will you provide the paper? I will provide the paper in the print box. Yes, you just have to have a pen, and I didn't have some pens, so it should be all right. Any questions about flashback friendly so far? Yes, no. Group project. Okay, so the group project. This worth 40%, so this is the biggest part of your overall grade. And this is broken down into a pitch presentation with a prototype demo, which is worth 10%. And it's happening somewhere in the middle. Again, it's in the syllabus. It's actually in the overview that I'll show you in a second. So first, you'll do the prototype demo in your teams. Then we'll have a final presentation with a completed prototype at the very end, which is also worth 10%. And then we have a final user research report on that. So this is where you kind of implementing some of the design ideas and you're reflecting on the research that you're doing on the design. So I call it a user research report, but it's also, you could call it a design report as well, right? Because it's really reflecting on the design that you've done for the prototype as you're going through the UX design journey. And so I'll give you a template for this report and you pretty much just follow the template, submit the report, and then you're done with that. So that's the last 20% class. Any questions so far? about this part, still living here. 
Okay. All right. So what's the class schedule like? So the class schedule, as you can see here, is today we're going to do the introduction to UX design and the course overview. Ideally, I wanted to release assignment one today. I might still be able to do it, but it's running pretty late, so it's looking like tomorrow. And we'll also have the first UX flashback family today. Okay? So that's what we're getting in the first week. Next week, we're going to talk about the history and evolution of UX design. So a little bit of the background. Where does it come from? Where does it go? Caught my door. Oh, okay. So that's the idea behind giving you some of that background. And then you have the first UX mini challenge in class, right? So we'll do the first 60 minute exercise there. Then we have business analysis. And you're wondering, hmm, business analysis. This is a UX start letter. What's going on? Any ideas why I would put business analysis in there? If this is a class targeted towards designers, what do you have to do with business thoughts? This UX design from a business advice. What would that look like? You don't know yet because you're taking this back. No, no, no. But yeah, so a business, what could a business perspective be? Why would it be important for UX? To better understand clients. To better understand clients. The client we read and how the business might. If you are an independent UX designer and you're not working for a company, if you were working for a company, you wouldn't have a client, you would have a stakeholder, a boss, and whatever. And then, yes, they would push those business needs upon you. So, yeah, actually, it, that's, uh, that's pretty much accurate. The idea behind good UX design is, and this is the most challenging thing that every graduate that I've had in my UX classes, one of the main things they told me when they entered the real world, the job world, is that the biggest problem was to balance between user needs, which I always preach in my classes, user needs, and business needs, right? And they said, no, you need to teach more business needs. <laughs> so at some point I was like, okay, gotta be an entire lecture about this. Because it is really, really important to know how to balance that out. It is not, it is, a lot of it is driven for you as advocating for the user, but that is not all of it. Part of the job is also understanding how to satisfy the business requirements to make a successful product. So. We'll dedicate an entire lecture to that. We have some excellent guest lecturers talking about this perspective as well. Then we go into information architecture, very fun bit, where we're doing a lot of like thinking about how do you actually build information. Those of you interested in web design should really dig that class, hard sorting and other stuff here. And then we talk about content strategy. Why content strategy? Does anyone even know what content strategy is? Does anyone ever encounter the term? So like social media content stuff? For example. We that out, we went and vouch. For example, that's probably the most common way that we're facing content strategy is people that do build social media profiles and they have content planner and they decide what types of content work. Uh, but content planning really goes beyond just social media, even though social media is the major distribution platform for a lot of online content these days. But it goes to the entirety of content that you have available. So it's pretty much the next step from information architecture. Information architecture is how do I present the content? Part of the strategy is how do I select the content I want to present? So you need to have both for this to be a successful design adventure. And then we go into design thinking. I have an excellent guest lecture here that's going to talk about design thinking. I'll uh, be really excited about that one. Then we hop into visual design. Visual design is part of UX design specifically with some of the confusion about like how much of the UI is actually part of the UX, right? And so like how much of that UI design is actually visual design? So it is really just a basic part primer where we're looking at the basic visual principles of design. You don't need to be a great designer to understand that. You just need to be able to understand what are the principles that go into that. And then we have user journey mapping. User journey mapping is pretty much understanding how the user actually transcends to the system that you've built, right? The user moves through each part of the system. We want to map that out to, for the system to be successful. And then the next step is, of course, the context of use. Every UX designer worth their salt will talk about context of use because for UX, for the experience to unfold, it is more than just building the thing that's inside of the computer. It is also understanding within which context that computer is used, right? So you need to understand your target users, but you also need to understand the environments in which things are done. For example, if you're a mobile game designer, you will structure the game very different than if you are a PlayStation 5 game designer, because the way that that game is played in a living room environment is very different from the kind of snack size playing that you would do on the bus or while you're waiting for something and you're just pulling out your phone to do a little bit of interaction there. So it's a very different 
thinking that goes into that, which is context of use. So we'll illustrate how that works. Which then brings us to this idea of, okay, so if we're looking at the context of use, we also need to look at how do we actually test this environment? And I'll give you, the, this is kind of going to go full circle, because today we're already doing a usability evaluation. We are throwing you right in the cold water. You probably don't know what you're doing. I'll make you do it anyways. It'll be a lot of fun. And hopefully, by the time we get back here, you'll remember this very first lecture. <laughs> you'll be like, oh, now it all makes sense. <laughs> okay, so that's the goal. Then we're kind of looking at, okay, usability. This is actually how it goes, and this is the specific measurements that we can take. And then, of course, the next step is user research, because the next big thing would be, okay, so how does it all fit into this environment of user research, which is, of course, also relevant for your final reports as you're structuring them. Like, how does an actual structured user research session work? How is it different from just a standard usability test? And how does it go beyond? So we're going to look out a little bit into, so what if you were to go to grad school? I'm not saying you should, but I show you a little bit of my life, where I do user research every day, and it's actually a lot of fun for me. And I'll try to convey some of that to you, and hopefully you'll see why this excites me. And then we'll go into the final project presentation at the very end of the class, and then we're done. And we call it a day. Okay. So, oh, question. Not that related to the slide, but won't we be using to create our prototype? Yes. So at the beginning, you will just be using paper. So what I would recommend to bring to the start is to bring a pencil, a simple pen, and a dot grid notebook if you can. I prefer dot grid on everything because I have the easiest time sketching on that, but I, you know, sometimes budget reasons or whatever, you just go to double ramen and grab a notebook. Something that is paper is fine with me, as long as you can, you know, get it there. I would recommend to bring that to every class. It'll make your life much easier, even though it's not necessarily a heavy requirement of the UX exercise we do in class. It will make your life easier to just sketch something out as you go through some of these things. In terms of tools for the actual exercise, we, I, I will leave it open to you, but I will heavily recommend Figma because it's free and because a lot of people know how to use it and because I can point you to 10,000 online tutorials on how to learn how to use it. And it's free, as I just did. <laughs> so definitely recommend using Figma for the final project. Okay, any other questions? Now, what happens if I submit later? That's too bad, but we don't actually need to have long discussions about your CAD that threw up on your homework and all of these things. It's just late, right? So let's just accept right now, if your work's late, it's going to be 5% deducted. We don't need to have long email discussions. We don't need to go back and forth. It's just going to be 5%. There's no exceptions. If you're late, it's 5% off. I should not rebate off the grade. And then within the next 24 hours, it's another 5%. And it just keeps going until you pass 50%, at which point you'll get a zero for the grade. Okay? It's very simple. A lot of the exercises are structured in a way that you have a lot of leeway. So really, there, there, sh there shouldn't be anything that would make you late for that specific exercise. But I know it always happens. It happens every year. I fully expect one of you to be late and to cash in that 5% rebate. It's OK. There is other exercises in this class where you can make up for that. Because again, keep in mind some of these uh, drop two and whatever. So you can get your 100% in the other exercises. And then you might just, you know, some of the homework assignments or whatever might be late. That's okay. I don't like no hard feelings, by the way. I don't mind, right? So you don't need to feel guilty or anything. It happens to me every term. It's okay to be late. Just understand it's going to be 5%. All right? Cool. Group activity. So for all group activities, kind of a similar idea here. Group activity is always painful, as you know, because you have to manage a group. And some of you are really good group workers, and some of you might not be so good group workers. And that also happens every year in every group. And that actually happens in your real job as well but it is going to be part of everyday life. But in school, we kind of have to think about like, how, do we, how can we mitigate that? How can we assess it somehow? So the idea for this class is that for all group activities, the mark portion is only 90% of your total mark. So that's what you get. You can get up to 90%. To get that extra percent, you have to pass peer review. So the remaining 10% is reserved for peer review. So if a student gets a good peer review and shows leadership, they will get the final 10%. So on the other hand, the peer reviews, and my follow-up in that case, if the peer review is bad, I would follow up. Reveal that a student has not pulled their weight, they will get penalized for the entire 10% where required. And maybe an additional 10% off of the entire mark. So for example, in a group of three where the submission gets full marks, one person shows leadership, one does excellent work without showing leadership, and the third person does not pull their weight. The first person will get 100%, the second person will just get the 90%, which is the full mark, and the third person will get the 10% reduction, which is the 80%. Okay? So far, so clear? 
or is it confusing? It might be a little confusing. At any point in time, also, if you don't feel like talking to me right now, you can just send me a DM about it later and clarify it, okay? But that's how we're going to assess the group work in this class. I'm also really excited to say that I've managed to get a lot of guest lectures for this class. Not all of them are 100% confirmed, but a lot of them have already signaled their interest. And we're currently in the process of scheduling them. So how do the guest lectures actually work? The guest lectures will come in at the beginning of the lecture. Some of them are actually in European time zone, uh, so it's pretty late for them. And we'll be using the same platform that we're using right now to broadcast the guest lecture here so that you all can participate. Of course, there will be a recording in case you've missed it, so you can catch up to the guest lecture after. And what I want you to do is, as soon as I announce the guest lecture, I've been trying to announce them about a week before in Learn. So as soon as you get that Learn announcement, I would want you to submit your questions for that guest lecture in the Teams channel. So the Teams channel, questions for guest lecture, just toss your questions in there as they come to you as you're getting the topic. And of course, during the guest lecture, at any point in time, you could also free to just drop your questions there because we do, after each guest lecture, we do have a short period of question and answer at the end of it. So 15 to 30 minutes, they all agreed to do that for us, uh, which I think is awesome. So we can really ask each other questions. And so to just give you a size, an example of um, who we have. So we have a couple of people like, I think, you know, I pronounced that correctly, which is a very common, well-known under the name Alpisign. I don't know if you've ever seen her stuff on Instagram. She's a very popular designer. She has like her own courses about design, a lot of materials that she's created online. We have the head of Smile.io. I don't know if you've heard about that. It's a design-focused company. Uh, so head of engagement, <laughs> head of design, bringing a lot of questions about how to actually ask the right questions. Yeah, the other ones actually have to figure out. But we have a, a lot of people that have uh, signaled their interest that are really excited to do this for us. And again, I will announce it before, and then I'll gather your questions and make those guest lectures available to you. And hopefully, we'll have one almost every lecture. Okay, so far, any questions? So far, so good. All right, we're going to be cleaning stuff today. So what I will do is, and you can already read it here, is I will go around and give each of you some nice little smudging here. Now that I put you every table in the room, your job is you've just been hired as a new junior designer at this company that has completely forgotten to train you and is just throwing you in the deep end as a UX designer. You got the chance to type UX that you're like, whoa, what's happening? And they want you to design a better multi-purpose cleaning utensil. Multi-purpose. I emphasize this, right? A multi-purpose cleaning utensil. Okay. So what I need you to do is I need you to form groups of five. I figured just like five people that are sitting together can just like coalesce somehow if we can make that work. Everyone's here should equally divide so that we have five groups. So that's my hope. And now that you kind of figure this out. So in groups of five, I want you to take different roles. Four of you should be taking notes. Just assuming that you have some sort of note-taking device, like iPad is fine or a notebook is fine. Uh, whatever you want to take notes on, take some notes. While one of you is trying out a provided cleaning utensil. Now I have enough cleaning utensils to go around so that everyone can try this out. I'm actually going to introduce the cleaning utensils, why not? So let's uh, set up the groups first so I can actually get my cleaning utensils sorted per group. Okay, so we got the five of you, so that's one, two, three, four, five. Socks here. It's the first group. We got the next group. One, two, three, four, five. So all of you and one group. One, two, three, four, five. You're with them. One group. And then we got one, two, three, four, five. You're one group. Oh, there's not that big club music. You know what? One, two, three, four. Group of four. Group of four. Two groups of four. One at the work. Not out of Okay, it's fine. It's fine. You can still do this with four people. Okay, so what we'll do is, don't call. What we'll do is, first we'll have to evaluate the competitors. Luckily for you, I run this company and I've already acquired all the competitors' products for you. So, as your uh, new design leads, what's that? I'm giving you all these competitor products and then this table and then this table. Then the idea here is that first you have to test each of the competitors' products. And I wanted to take detailed notes on each of these competitors' products. And then, 
to basically running what's called the usability test. I'm going to give you the spiel of what's the usability test. So if you're just running a simple unstructured user research study, you would just say, do something, I'll observe you. Now for a usability test, you give somebody a task. Lucky for you, I've already given you the task by making your, your tables messy. Your task is cleaning up the dirt, right? And if you clean up, because unfortunately I've only provided two stains here, if you clean up the stains, definitely feel free to use my markers, which I will position here so you can help pointing it. Get them here. Feel free to get more markers and make more mess, okay? Because I want you to test each of these competitors' products for, and this is where it gets about the nitty gritty of usability. Usability, and we'll talk about that after this, is actually defined as these three bits here effectiveness, efficiency, satisfaction. So, effectiveness means define what means cleaning success. Just to give you a tip, because I just hired you, you don't know much about it yet. I would define cleaning success as completely wiping off that stain, that one stain, okay? So, we'll keep it at that. That's cleaning success. So, you track how successful each of these wipes off that stain. The next thing is you track how fast can you stop watch it and see how long does it actually take you to clean that thing. And you take note of each of these for each tool. And then satisfaction. So the one person, like I said at the meeting, one of you is doing the cleaning at a time, the rest of you are observing, right? So the one person that's doing the cleaning, and then you go around rock and we just uh, change it around. And so you do one person to this tool, then the next person to the next tool, and so forth, right? And so the idea is. And you quiz that person how happy they were with that cleaning result, if it was to their full satisfaction or not. Okay, perfect. So these are actually tricky ones, because these are already multi-purpose tools. For these, you have to do two tests. You have to do the spongy bit, and you have to do the rust bit. So this is two different tools with this sponge here. I didn't want to cut it apart, so it's a two for one deal. Okay. So we're testing this one twice, and then oh, that's some of the competitors. Then we got the next one. These wonderful plastic new bugs. Sorry, you bought the cheese. Okay, jump so me. Done. Just try it out as well. Okay. And then we've got these tools. So brushes. Okay. So, and then the last one is so obviously I'm going to give you this as well. Do not spray this into your face. The only dangerous thing that I have today on. Oh, yeah, it's working. So this, as soon as you request me, I'll come do a little spray for you, okay? As soon as you're ready, just raise your hand and I'll do a little spray and you can use it with the tool of your choosing. Okay? There's also wet wipes, but I don't know if I can take those out and they will be dry by the time, so I will just deposit the wet wipes here, they'll be your last tool to test. Okay? And deposit them in the middle. Okay. So far, so good. I also, if we have particularly tough stains, call me in if none of them can actually clean up the mess at the very end. Lysol will probably do this job, I figure it out. So that's just for emergencies. Okay, so far, any questions? Everyone clear about the exercise? Yes? Okay, so we're not done yet. So as you're doing all of that, you take in the trust being, you're reporting for everyone for every tool, then you use your observations and notes to design a better cleaning utensil. Okay, so we got like an hour for this entire exercise. So keep it nice and tight, I'd say. 50% split, you just do the usability test and the reporting. And then after the first 30 minutes, we're going into design things, right? Some of you might take a little longer and a little less time for design, which is fine too, but then you really got to sprint up the design. So the, for the design, you base your design on the findings of your user tests, okay? User-centered design, we're already doing it, okay? So then the last thing that you do is you just have to come forward and do a little pitch and pitch is really just a pitch, a two minute pitch of your design tool, wide Excel, you go round robin at the very end, I shall give you a break before, and then we'll go round robin, and, and that's it, and then we'll continue the lecture. Any questions so far about this exercise? It's super safe, nobody should be in the any question. Other than me, I'll probably talk about this. Okay, all right, everyone ready to go? Let's go, time is running. Set the timer to six minutes. All right, welcome back, folks. And welcome to the last bit of the lecture. You might be wondering why we just did this exercise, right? And so one of the big ideas that we're facing as we're dealing with user experience and user testing, and user research, and these kind of things, is this idea of usability. Back before user experience became a big thing, it was all about usability. And usability, was at some point defined by these three items, effectiveness, 
efficiency, and satisfaction. So this was done by the International Organization for Standardization, which created this framework, specifically trying to break down that these are things that we can actually measure, right? And I've already given you these as tasks as you're evaluating this. Uh, hopefully, you've taken note of some of these effectiveness was pretty much whether or not they can successfully complete the task. And this is done in usability tests, usually by seeing if there's a completion or a non-completion. And we call that the success or the failure rate in usability research. So effectiveness is always about success or failure rates, is how many errors are being done as people are doing the task. And then the next one, efficiency, is all about how quickly users can actually perform the task. And a lot of the tasks that we have in usability are finding tasks. We have a website, and then on the website, we want to find something really quickly. Or we have an app, we have some sort of software, and people need to find information. So we give them a task and say, find this information, and then we time how quickly they can get that information. Or we give them a task such as find this item first on Amazon, let's say, and then put that item in your shopping cart. So it's like finding it and then moving the item to a different location. And so this is really where we're measuring efficiency. And then satisfaction is really where it all took off, where we're really asking users how would they describe their experience using the system. And so satisfaction, in this case, is really what took off that movement of user experience because it was looking at the software factor of users interacting with the products, the feelings that they have, the kind of uh, enjoyment they would get out of an interaction. And so there are several uh, strategies that you can assess this, but the most popular strategy that we'll do in this course is we'll do a little bit of interviewing and looking into how you can get qualitative response. Now, there's a whole realm of user research that we could go into. We only have one lecture at the very end, if you remember, but this is really where we can get that wealth of information about a person and we can go really deep into what they're feeling and how they're interacting with something. Okay, so how did user experience actually become a thing and like, how did it gain popularity? And one of the stories that I like to tell with this in particular, is the story of Lego. So Lego really had a rough patch in the early 2000s because they were kind of stuck in the rut, trying to do the same thing over and over again. So they ended up losing about $1 million a day. They had over-diversified and had very expensive specialized sets. So it was actually very difficult for them to build and create and craft new blocks because they had so many different Lego blocks that it was actually more expensive building all the different blocks than selling them because all of the sets were so specialized. And then they hired a new CEO at that stage, Jürgen Wieck Knutstorp, who said, let's get back to the bricks and really dig deep into the thing that makes us tick, which is kids playing with our bricks. So he formed what then was one of the first big UX teams at a company. They were called the Anthros because they were mainly made up out of anthropologists. Does anyone here know what anthropology is? Have you come across this term or have like the vaguest idea of what it could mean? Give it a shot. A bit of human history. Human history. Human is good already. The study of culture. Culture, yeah. I've been explained to it by the study of people. Yeah, that's more, yeah. So, and of course, all of this is related, right? Like, because without people, we don't have culture, right? It's, it's this idea of how do people interact with one another, right? And so really, a lot of UX research, a lot of UX design comes from that idea of understanding how people work, understanding people, understanding the who, the what, and the why of people interacting with one another. In this case, understanding the play that was done with Lego. And so the specialized sets that uh, Lego was selling didn't really foster a lot of the imagination of the kids back then. So these anthros actually found out when they were, they were all of a sudden, they were studying Lego all over the globe, right? So they were looking at different player behaviors, not just at the North American market, but they also went to Japan, for example. And some of you might know a little bit about Japan. In Japan, play and education are not two things that go together well. In North America, this might be a thing where we say, yeah, it's actually really cool to play and be educational about it. Whereas in Japan, there is this fundamental understanding that play and education should not go together, specifically in the more traditional mindsets, right? And so the anthropologists from Lego found out about that and found out that this couldn't be the selling point in that different culture, whereas the selling point in the US was educational play. You're actually playing to learn something so that they mm -hmm. had to tailor their approach 
to different markets. And one of the interesting things happened was when they were interviewing a German kid, actually, that was just talking about what they really enjoyed. So the anthropologists actually went to the homes of people where the, the people were playing with the Legos and the kids were playing with the Legos. And so there was this kid sitting there with scuffed up skateboard shoes. And they were just asking, OK, so why, why do you like these shoes so much? Because, of course, the parents said, like, this you know, the favorite set of shoes there. And so what the kid then told the researchers was that these scuffs are pretty much my badge of mastery. This is my social currency among my friends. It means that I can do these tricks on my skateboard. And this is actually the marker for that that shows that I'm the person that can do this. And in the same way, I want this reflected in the way that I built my Legos. I want to be able to tell stories. I want to show people how I can master the combination of these different bricks. All of a sudden, they had that understanding that Lego could actually have simple bricks and provide new sets and new puzzles. And this is the Lego that you see today where you can do a lot with very simple bricks. So it's actually really easy to manufacture these bricks. But then the challenges come from how you combine these bricks to do interesting challenges. Uh, you might have seen this. This was a meme on, on Twitter. Was, actually, that might have been when you were in high school, thinking about it since <laughs> like 10 years ago, maybe 15. But it was a thing at some point when people were posting different ways to create a duck with the same five to six Lego pieces. So you actually had to create different ducks with the same pieces all over again. And it was kind of a challenge, and they took a picture, and then you uh, yeah, talked about it on social media. So this is kind of interesting to see how Lego just turned this around, and now they're at $7.44 billion. It's a giant company, probably the biggest toy company in the world, right? And so this is a good example where Lego just really used that power of user research to turn the company around and become really powerful. Now, we also see a lot of examples where bad UX design actually causes a lot of problems, because a lot of companies are not really thinking about UX. So when packaging and designing something wrong, it can actually have fatal effects. Now, this is a story specifically on this side where I'm just in front of it right now. This drink here is called the Omo Active and Sport drink. And as you can see from the labeling here, this is clearly Norwegian. So this was actually handed out in 2014 at a Norwegian bicycle race as a promotional item, right? But as people are going to a bicycle race, what happens is, what do bicyclists do? What do you think? Has anyone ridden a bicycle recently? What happens when you ride a bicycle for a long time? Sure, butt starts hurting, but other than that, Thanks, you get thirsty. Exactly, just like any sport, right? You get thirsty. So one of the cyclists actually drank the detergent because it was called active in sport. So they thought, oh yeah, that's great. That's probably an energy drink. And so uh, what happened is, uh, that then they had to be uh, raised to the hospital. And this was part of the, the Fredagsbirken competition. And uh, yeah, it was one of the most negative events that you could find in terms of marketing for this company that was trying to promote the, uh, the product. And so clearly not a good idea to mark when it's a detergent. I think the only thing that could give it away is the larger birth, you know, the, the larger cap of the thing. But other than that, the design and everything could have been mistaken for a sports drink, right? And so the company did not understand that difference in terms of packaging. Unfortunately, they're not the only company that's doing that. So if you go to Dolorama, as you just saw it today, it's not as bad as this anymore, but it's still pretty bad. If you've ever seen Fabul Fabuloso on the shelves, Fabuloso are a company that is notorious for this, and they have several lawsuits that they're fighting with because the way that they package their cleaner looks very much like Fanta. I don't know if a lot of you know Fanta, but that's a very sugary, very nice soft drink. And so what happened is there was actually a, a mass study from the Texas Poison Center Network, which found that there's 694 cases of people accidentally drinking Fabuloso in the United States because of the way that it's packaged, because of the way that it smells and that it tastes. So this is the weird thing. So if you accidentally actually put it and taste it, you will find that it actually has, of course, you'll taste the soap at some point, yeah, no kidding. But you'll find that it has that, that little bit of the, the fruity smell that these days, with a lot of the artificial stuff that we find, even in things like, what's my favorite, bubbly, where you can get pretty much sparkling water with any kind of flavor that you want, it is much harder for us to identify because of the fake flavor, like if this is actually dangerous for us. In this case, there's like a fake flavor smell thing going on here. Specifically, if you have things like lavender, passion fruit and citrus, those are usually things that you would find in drinks that you would ingest and not necessarily in cleaners, although lavender is used a lot in cleaners, of course. But the important thing is that it would A, mean a child-proof cap, because children, of course, will not know that. They would very easily mistake this. 
And the labeling was not there. None of the labeling actually said, this is a multi-purpose cleaner, right? Like it just had the big tubby loss. So clearly a case where design could have fixed the problem and where bad design is continuing to cause a problem. And this is very, very simple design, such as the design of the packaging. But it can even be worse. UX can actually simply kill people, specifically if we're looking at UX and machinery. Now, this is an interesting case, an unfortunate incident that happened back in 2016. You might have heard about this. So there's an, a super talented actor named Anton Yelchin. Uh, you might have, if you've seen Star Trek, like he was in there in the remake. He was also in, I think, one of the Avengers movies. I don't know. He was in, in some of the very big movies. So he was pretty much one of those, like, about to become a star moments, right? Like, he was pretty much on the brink of becoming really, really famous. And then in 2016, all of a sudden, he died. And while we don't really have the details of how he died, one of the things that we know is that he was driving a Jeep Grand Cherokee. And one of the things that we find in the Jeep Grand Cherokee is a recall gear shifter that we can see in this picture here. Now, if you look at this picture of the gear shifter, what comes to mind right away? Now, of course, you can see that I've already put it here. A traditional automatic transmission slides into position. So if you have, I don't know if any of you have actually driven like a real stick shift car in your life, ever, anyone? So in that, you see that there is definitely, it's like never right safe after one, but you can just put it right in the gear, right? And there's a lot of movement around. In the automatic cars, what do we have left? We have left that it's into the position. It was slotted into your pillow, it was slotted into drive, and you can see that it's slotted in that position. Now, what is happening with this monostable shifter is, what can you imagine? It's right here. I'm standing in front of it. It's on my chest. I mean, what stands the binding like under east? The receptor, it's like not fine trans, so we might give it to act on with the pen with. Yeah, you definitely not use it to the gear. But then what happened after that? More so like the shifter, like you put it in drive, it will come back to that side. Exactly. That's the mono stable idea of it, which is absolutely nonsense. So pretty much you shift it, and then it doesn't, the indicator doesn't actually stick in the indication, it just comes back to the original position. So you have to look really closely in whether or not anything is highlighted here. And you can see it's not even red, right? It's just a little light that actually indicates, okay, I'm in park or I'm in drive. So really, really not enough indication of what gear you're in. And of course, you know, it was recalled 1.1 million Jeep Grand Cherokees and Dodge vehicles with that uh, Fiat monostable shifter have been recalled over the years. So clearly a major design flaw. If you're a designer of that thing, you're probably not sleeping well, right? So... I don't know what the idea behind the design was, but obviously when you're designing something like that, you always have to consider the human. And the human needs indicators. Like one of the things why there was a lot of criticism about Tesla move towards the automation or the capitalization of the user interface in cars was what? What can you imagine? Now, unfortunately, long boring cars have touch screens, but a lot of them still have dials and dashes and buttons. Why is that? Why do you think that's so important in Paris? Feedback and like feedback and spatial memory. Exactly. Because that is really important when you're busy with a different task that is driving, where you really have to pay attention. Because like I would say, it is very important to rely on haptic feedback and spatial memory so that you can quickly adjust. So Tesla is a product when you draw the car's driving itself. So we really don't need to worry. It's just really take care of each all of our family. Fair point. But um, getting rid of a lot of that is actually really dangerous. In, in driving situations because you do need that kind of feedback, which is also still why airplane cockpit, we'll talk about airplanes in a second, still have a lot of these dials and switches and knots because it is just easier to find what exactly you need to adjust based on that spatial memory and the haptic feedback that you're getting as you're interacting with that, okay? And this is the problem that happened with Anton Yeltsin. To come back to our story, Yeltsin, one time after, put his Jeep on the driveway, was on a slam, and uh, thought he had put it in park, but clearly didn't. And walked back behind the car, and the car crushed him right next to the garage door. Because, and again, we don't know it, because obviously in college, we're going to make it public. We don't know it, but the parents are now suing Chrysler. So clearly something is there, and he was driving the car that had exactly this design flaw. So an interesting thing where you find like a, a popular case of a famous person actually dying based on bad user experience design in this case. So clearly one of the things where the design has actually gone wrong. Now, here's another example. You might've seen this movie on the Netflix if you on the Netflix, man, I sound old. So 
If you, if you finally see the Airbus documentary on Netflix, if not, check it out. Really interesting documentary about why Airbus is actually, you know, struggling so much, specifically because of what's called the MCAS, the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System. is one of the things that they put in a lot of their, a lot of the technology that they put in a lot of the airplanes. And another thing that comes with that is also confusing interfaces, which can be very problematic if you're trying to navigate a flight. Now, in this case, it was 1992, the Air Interflight Flight 148 crashed into the Waskis Mountains when it was approaching Strasbourg Airport in France. About 87 out of the 96 crews and passengers on board were killed. So that's a lot of people that got killed in that plane crash. And the accident report described it back then as the most advanced cockpit in the world, which tried then to blame the pilot for user error in this case. Now, this, of course, led to a deeper investigation when they were looking at aircraft control. They found that specifically when you're looking at the, the black box where you're seeing the pilot communications. So they found that the pilot thought they were descending at 3.3 degrees. However, instead of that, they were descending at a rate of 3,300 feet per second. Now, can you tell me what the difference is if you look at this dashboard? It's pretty close, right? So unless you're like super trained and you're really paying a lot of attention here, you can see that the labels are not very clear and the, the labels are pretty close to each other. So like knowing exactly what is happening here is, is really key and, and making sense of that information pretty quickly in an emergency situation might not happen specifically when the numbers are so close to each other, right? Like if you don't know that that's 3,300 feet per minute, then you're actually not aware that the, the plane is about to crash because it's on a very dangerous flight angle. Okay, this is an error that we actually refer to. This is a common error in user interface design that we call a mode error. It's a type of slip where a user performs an action that's appropriate to one situation but not appropriate to another one, right? So it's something, for example, when in Google Chrome, so you might use this or a different, actually in most modern browsers, you have this also based on Chromium, the difference between private and regular browsing is pretty subtle, right? It's actually put a lot of more effort in recent years in the design to make it a little bit less subtle, but it used to be very subtle, but it was slightly light gray. I think now it's like really pretty black, dark, like really intense, but it's still graphically subtle. So just to know that was at the beginning when they brought it out, I think it was just like a little X or something on the corner. So it wasn't even the, the background of the browser that changed. So it was just a slight X. I think now it's really just the entire window, right? So the implications of that mode switch, whether you're in private mode or not, can be pretty great because you might accidentally share a lot of information that you're not actually aware of sharing that, or that you wanted to withhold from a different party, right? So the mode is not graphically given the importance that the situation actually requires in this case, right? Because the indicator of the mode was actually uh, pretty insignificant. So you want to make sure that if you're, if you're doing mode switches, that you're making that feedback clear to the user as they're interacting with that. And this is kind of where we really have to think about the value of UX, right? So now that we've seen all these mistakes and errors that are happening in user experience uh, design, Investing in usability and user research is a strategic asset that you do at the beginning of development and design of something that helps you avoid these costs. All of these are very costly mistakes, not just in human lives, also in terms of money that's being lost, right? Like very, very costly mistake that could have been avoided if more user research would have been done, right? This idea of value is really important when you're going into a company, you're communicating about UX. And it's something that we continue to struggle with as a field. Uh, some of you might be following some of the recent layoffs in the tech industry, Google, Facebook, now Meta, Amazon, everyone's firing UX people, right? Like in the last year, the first people to go were the UX people because all of a sudden it was just like, we're just going to focus on product, right? And so, which is also why UX designers are now often called product designers because the product focus of a lot of these companies is all about product and we can just envision and kind of figure it out and it'll just come. But the, the problem is in the long term, that's not going to work because just even one costly mistake can ruin an entire company. And again, of course, these are bigger companies that are not necessarily always seeing that value right away. So it is a lot of argumentation and a lot of lobbying and that advocacy that needs to happen by people that are entering this field of UX research. And so like 
this is going to be you alive if you decide to be in the UX field, to be arguing for that value that you're essentially helping the company save money in the long term. You're helping them create additional service costs, documentation costs, whatever have you, um, that are part of the development process that can be avoided if you're doing proper testing at the beginning. And it all relates to this idea that you can find in the Don't Make Me Think book that user effort is finite, right? So Steve Krug says this so nicely when he describes in the book saying that a person of average ability and experience can figure out how to use an item to accomplish something without being more trouble than it's worth. This notion of being more trouble than it's worth is really at the heart of a good user experience. And this is something that probably you've been thinking about as you've been designing your products today. It's just like, are we actually providing enough value with the product? Like, is this something that people can figure out and that really will help make their lives better? People eventually do give up if something is too complicated. If and again, we're just looking at cleaning products. A lot of these things weren't too complicated today because they're pretty simple products. But if you were to test more complicated products, you'd probably at some point run into this idea that the product is too complicated and that you're not willing to learn it anymore. So to overcome this resistance that we have towards learning a new product, we need to remove that friction that is provided by bad design and overcome it with good design that then enables us to use the product without having too much trouble using it. Because again, if the value that the product provides is so high that the person is willing to take that friction, as an example, I don't know if ever, anyone has ever used Linux or any Unix-based system. Most of you might not, but if you have, you know that a lot of the people that really value the systems value them for the configurability and the, the privacy and just the power that it provides to the individual user. So they're willing to overcome all of the friction that is provided by a lag or a suboptimal user interface that is provided by these computing systems. Whereas other companies such as Apple or even Microsoft these days with the new iterations of Windows actually being leaps and bounds ahead of Apple in terms of user interface design and Apple catching up recently. So this is actually an interesting development that we've seen. So what we're seeing these days is that the user interfaces are actually becoming things for people to engage with the computing experience, right? So they're removing the friction up front so that people are seeing the value now not in the computing power of the system, but in the ease of use with which they can accomplish a task, which is also the biggest selling point of all of these new AI tools, where back in the day, one or two years ago, the biggest thing was, now we don't need to enter things on the keyboard anymore. We can just talk to our phone and it'll write the email for us. Now, in the new co-pilot that's coming, that's basically ChatGPT and all of your office applications, it's just like, instead of writing the CV myself, I'll just tell it to write the CV in a specific way and then it will generate the CV for me and all of a sudden it looks perfect, right? I don't have to write the email anymore. Write a nice email to my boss that I'm, I want to be fired. Boom. Email sent and it just sounds amazing, right? So all of a sudden we have these new abilities and we're willing to pay for it. We're willing to invest it because the value that's provided is intense for us. So value is always up front for this. So what's your role as a UX designer? We're kind of running out of time. But... Your role is that you may focus on research design or both depending on company size. And this is where it gets interesting, where the term UX designer becomes a little bit muddled because UX designers can also be UX research and UX research might be a part of your design process. It's all combined depending on company size. A lot of the times you're wearing multiple hats as a UX designer, specifically in small startup companies. They will just want everything from you, which makes it so much more difficult, but you learn so much if you start at that level. Whereas if you want to start in one of those Fang companies, anyone familiar with that term? Fang, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, right? I forgot one A. Apple, thank you. So we call that Fang. It's like the big tech people, right? I mean, everyone dreams of working for them, right? Again, they may have dedicated teams. They may have a dedicated UX research team and they may have a dedicated design team. But that also means more politics, more procedures, and less room to innovate, right? Something to keep in mind. And so we're not going to watch these videos. I'm going to make them available in, in Learn, so for you to follow up on them. But one of the first things that comes to mind as we're thinking about good design, because we talked about bad design so much, is of course a Normandor. Who already knows the Normandor? Some people might have already encountered a Normandor. Is that a Normandor? That is absolutely a Normandor. What is Normandor for? I mean, up there. It signals the opposite of what it should do, right? So this is a Normandor because it has a knock. And most Normandor pools. Most doors are Normandor. We just don't need them anymore. So what's not a normal door? A door that pretty much has a face they to put, so you just kind of have to walk into the court and it looks open. You know, it's very complicated method, right? And you just push the door to open, and then from the outside, when you pull it, there's a handle, right? 
That is not a normal door. The normal door is the door that throws. This is the normal door because it is, it is doing the opposite of what it's supposed to do. Because on this, that's in the MI, and it's straight the other side, but you did this. So if it has a handle on both sides, that's confusing. The handle should only be on the side where you pull it. When you push it, the handle does not signal pulling, uh, pushing. The handle only signals pushing. Pulling. Jesus Christ, then. So close together. Okay. And the pulling, fixed state pushing, right? That's the difference. So the flat plates are the ones that you want to have on one side, and the pulling are the ones you have on the other side. And Norman came up with this as he was, I think he was on sabbatical or something, you know, professor of everyday, you know, of the line, you know, of psychology. And so he went on a sabbatical or something in England, and he was, I think the trigger that first triggered him, first of all, the teapots and everything, so the design of everything, everyday things, you'll see the teapots that he's talking about. But then also, anyone, I think we have it here in Canada quite a lot too. So we have that English design here. So a lot of these faucets are English system. We got a hot one and a cold one. Does anyone know why the English have developed that and why that's a thing? And we actually have a separate... Because in Europe, so I'm German, so most of my life I haven't dealt with these two faucets. I find that still very horrible. We just have one thing. And then we just... And you've seen it probably in your kitchen, right? Like, because you see it in a lot of kitchens here. We just have one thing and then you can do cold and then hot just based on the direction of the, of the faucet, uh, faucet, right? So why, why, do, why do the British have the, the cold ones? Anyone know by any chance? Because of the tea. Because of the tea. So that they can have the cold, fresh water for their tea that, and then they steam. That's the story that I heard from my British friends. This is why we have these, these two different hot and cold ones, right? So that you can just mix the temperatures of the water out there. Okay, so design principles are really important. As you're designing these things, Norman was one of the first to come up with that. And that, of course, also brings into question, and again, you should watch that video. This is Norman himself talking about it, about what is actually UX. And that's how we're going to end today. UX is not just the product or service. What we did today was just a tiny part of UX. UX starts much before that. It includes finding a product. So that's already like looking for the product. So discovering the product in everyday life. Buying the product, the checkout experience, opening the product, the unpacking experience, putting it together, right? Like Ikea, that's a product. That's part of the product. If you solve the puzzle, you end up with furniture. If you don't solve it, you don't have furniture. That's a part of the experience of Ikea. It's part of the user experience. And even then talking about it with other people, right? Like, oh, I really like this Apple product. This designs are so smooth. I'm going to tell every one of my friends about it. Okay. Part of the experience, which then cycles into finding a product because Word of mouth is finding the product, and it's just one big user experience life cycle, right? It's not just the product, it's everything attached to it. And that is what UX really is. Okay, not really going to talk about that. I'm just going to mention it. You're going to see it in the video as you watch it. Vocabulary inflation. One of the biggest problems we have in UX is we keep calling it different things. UX design, user centered design, whatever it is. It keeps shifting every four years. He's uh, made a list, I think it's like 38 terms over eight years, something. Watch the video. It's really enlightening. He kind of breaks down. He's got a little keynote on that. He says, like, other fields like psychology and history, they've had the same name for their fields since, like, before Christ in terms of history. That's how long it's been called history, right? Psychology, the same way. Psychology has been called psychology for decades. It just keeps changing. HCI, user centered design, design thinking, and, like, whatever have you, right? Like, so you got to, like, be really clear what is it that we're doing. And yes, every one of these subfields will have a fervent advocate that will tell you, no, this is why it's named that way. But really, at the heart of it, we're all studying the same thing. We're all in the same field. Why keep relabeling it, right? And this is one of the biggest challenges as you're trying to find a job that also is going to lead you to this problem, UX versus UI, right? Because a lot of the jobs will look for UX slash UI designers or UI slash UX designers. Any thoughts on that? Do you think UX and UI are different things? Or what are your thoughts about UX and UI? Yes. I think UI is like part of user experience, mm -hmm. more so than like user interface is like one is like part of like how it like user interface. Okay. Does everyone agree with that? Dissenting opinions? I was just going to say like UI is more like the how it's going to get done and then UX more like the overall, I guess. I don't know. You could say that UI is just the execution of UX, right? Because UI is how you're actually going to visualize the thing. But UX is more like, how does it actually work? Like, where do I need to click and what's the flow of the thing? Like, how do I do the user journey and everything around it? Of course, right? However, once you go into LinkedIn and you look for jobs, it's all the same thing. Even product design, it's all the same thing. And they're like happy calling it the same thing. 
And I was like, who cares, right? For you, I just want you to be aware of these shenanigans going on in professional life. And it's, as an academic, I think there's value to labeling things very specifically. But I do understand my fellow colleagues in the industry that really don't care if it's UX UI because they're all doing a little bit of everything. And that's okay. And you probably will have to. For me, this would all be labeled as UX because for me, that's a big umbrella term. For them, it's a slash. All right. This, I was going to say this sums it up, but I had more slides. This is another thing. As a UX designer, you got to go through these important qualities. And, and this is a fun thing. But if you talk about UX in public, the, the one thing people will always throw at is, but you got to have empathy. You got to have the empathy. And so what is empathy? Anyone? Can you explain what empathy is? Because it's such an important quality of our practice. What's empathy? Understanding a person's thoughts and dreams. <laughs> Thank you for reading it off my slide. Okay. Taking other people's like feelings into consideration and understanding like, their perspective as well and like, how they use. How does that work? I know that that's what I've written here. I know that that's what we, but how does that actually work? Then you know how it actually works. And this is also where it gets tricky because this is where I think it was normally, yeah, I'm just going to quote everything with normal ideas since one of the tools said it, but saying like you are not your user is the big thing that like, you know, and your teacher do that and whatnot, right? But like this is the thing. You are not, you're not, you, you can have the empathy, but you're not the user. So what's the empathy? The empathy is basically saying that I will, if you are providing this to me, I will try to understand it. But the tricky bit that is often misunderstood with empathy is the overcoming of our limitation. What limitations do we have? The perfect human beings that we are. Like what limitations do we have? Anything come to mind? Okay, I'm gonna drop the bomb right now. Oh no, you're gonna do it. Bison. Thank you! You're saying exactly what I was going to say. Exactly. Biases. Cognitive biases. Does anyone know what that is? What's a cognitive bias? Stereotypes. Stereotypes, for example. Racial, gender stereotypes, very common thing, right? What other biases do we know? Political beliefs, right? Like biases that we have. We get this person believing in this party, that party. Sure, that biases us right away. What other biases? Can see how they think of it. Just so I did. Have some things that we have thought of the sort of the more general view of this thing, yeah. Our sensibility. What's the bias in accessibility? Like, I don't want to be correct, but I know what. Able bodied bias, yeah. We're just assuming everyone's able bodied, right? Like that's a problem because not everyone is. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely a bias that we have towards able bodiedness. There's a bias that we have in Western cu cultures towards white identities, although I'm very not necessarily, you know, that's a difficult thing to touch. I don't teach about gender stereotypes, but definitely one of the biases that we have in there. Another bias that we have, positivity bias. Did you know that? What the positivity bias? You assume the best of people. Did you know that? You actually assume the best of people. This problem we all have, actually. And like if everything is equal, we just go with like that person probably meant well, which is a very common bias that a lot of us have. Not everyone, but the majority of the population, right? Really, really tricky bit. Then we have things and things such as, if anyone's ever been in a relationship, you heard of the side cost fallacy? What is that? It's like once you've committed something, you can't get it back. So you feel like you have to continue to commit that. Exactly. So once you sign cost in it, usually it's time or money for other types of engagement. But usually time or money. If you've sunk a lot of that into something, you ascribe that value to this relationship that you have to think of that person, whatever it is, which is completely irrational. And so you're not taking an action to change it because you're valuing that high because of the investment that you've made into it. We all do it. It's really bad, but we can't help it. So, and there's a lot more of these. I could give an entire lecture about cognitive biases. There's hundreds of them, right? And so the thing with empathy is becoming aware of our biases as we're doing these studies and just actively reflecting that we're very biased people going into this. We're biased people observing people. We're biased people making sense of the data. We're biased people even forming the research question. We are biased and we need to acknowledge that. And sometimes we need to do a little head check with our colleagues because we have a hard time noticing that about ourselves. So empathy, true empathy is acknowledging that bias and trying to overcome it so that you can truly understand the other person because you are not the other person. Your bias limits you from understanding that other person. So that's the trick. So that's the first one, empathy, overcoming the bias, and really feeling, walking the mind in the other shoes as best as you can. And then pragmatism. Pragmatism is super important. 
you have to thank Morgan for. Pragmatism is, I put it in milestones, but like, what, what is pragmatism really? Like, why is it so important for you? So then it's not just understanding the user in a perfect way, but also at the end of the day, which is what I said in your design evolutions, you also need to ship it. You need to be solutions focused. You need to analyze findings, but you can analyze findings that will house them home and then you make a decision which of these findings you should end up on. So being actionable and identifying the things that we should take action upon is a really powerful skill of the UX researcher that you need to hone and cultivate. Pragmatism, that's where that comes in. And then of course, collaboration, I mean, you're kind of aware of what that is. You gotta collaborate by incorporating diverse viewpoints into your research. You gotta understand diverse personalities and different work styles. And you're all gonna face that in your group work because you're all gonna work with different personalities and you're going to work with different work styles. And the only way to make group work successful at university is acknowledging those work styles right away. So if any of you, and I'm sure all of you are bringing different work styles to the groups that you're going to be in, please make sure to let your group mates know right away, this is how I work. Try to acknowledge your personal thoughts right away. It will make for a much better group environment because you're acknowledging your shortcomings and you're acknowledging your strengths as well. And you're saying, I'm really good at this, right? Let's all be clear about that so we can get the best possible group work done. That is the best way to do it for collaboration. Okay, so that wraps up some of these qualities. And then one of the other things, and again, here you can really just watch the video in depth. One of the things that I want us to understand, because this is really how we do a lot of UX design today, is a methodology that was pioneered by Jake Knapp uh, at Google. And I think he did it like with Slack and some other big companies. Um, Google Ventures, that is. So he did like on the consulting level. So he comes into companies and helps them like build design product. So the idea is pretty much go through the entire product design cycle in five days. That's a design sprint. And it's on his book, Design Sprints, aptly titled. And it's also in this video. So pretty much the first day is all about just understanding the problem. And this is also like if you're going through a group project, you go to any training design project, you follow the same step as these five days. First, you got to understand the problem. Then you got to sketch the solutions, prototyping and so forth. Then you got to review the sketch yet. Ideally, you're testing it a little bit, but you're reviewing it. Expert reviews, heuristic reviews. You're doing an initial assessment of the prototype or of the sketch that then leads to the prototype. Because I guess I use prototype pretty widely. So prototypes use like a paper prototype. And then you would actually build the prototype, like a functional Figma type of prototype where you're clicking and interacting. And then full on evaluation saying, does it work? Does it actually work if I put it in front of the real user? And then do it again. Do I have, have I understood the problem? Or did I just redefine the problem and go back into the process? So really rapidly developing products in five days and tar testing it with target users right away. So that's the idea of a design sprint. Essentially saying, okay, can we go from just brainstorming to something that's more effective than brainstorming? We're actually building like a little mini solution in five days. And then we can work from there. It's a very, very popular way to run your design in companies. And then this one, here's the thing, you've probably heard about them already, I'm assuming. If not, these are kind of important as a first rough testing and assessment of a product without involving the actual user pen, right? So heuristic, R, it's a fancy name, but it's really just like guidelines or checklists for experts, right? So expert means somebody that already understands how user interfaces work, such as Nielsen who came up with them. And then using these checklists, and again, this is pretty much the checklist is right here. You can just take the slide and use it as your heuristic basic. Because it already tells you what to look for, right? Visibility of system status. The design should inform users about what's happening through appropriate, timely feedback, right? Like there always needs to be good feedback about the system, like what is actually happening. And then if you see that, you check it off. Match between system and the real world. The design should speak the user's language. Really important to not be like error 99, but be like, okay, this is what happened specifically. This is how the system is reacting right now. You've clicked on the wrong button. The system is shutting down, something like that. So thinking about how, you, how the error messages are worded and how the system is communicating any shortcomings with the user is a large part of this matching between system and the real world. And also about the interface itself. And this is where it gets really interesting. Have you ever heard of the term skeuomorphism or neomorphism? What's skeuomorphism? Skeuomorphism is like imitating what I... Exactly. So back in the day, when we just got started with the iPhone and so the digital app, People didn't grow up as digital natives. I think you could all call yourself digital natives. You grew up with touchscreens, pretty much. Like you, probably your first computer was a touchscreen, I would assume. Maybe not. 
But you pretty much, like I would say, all of you are familiar with touch screens, right? Like it's the thing that you just know how to use. You've used it since your childhood, right? Whereas most people, before the big first touch screens were introduced, were actually more used to keyboards and they did their calendar planning on physical calendars. So actually the first calendar app that Apple had developed had like a graphic that looked like the leather of a calendar. It had like very realistic look and feel to it, right? Whereas now it's like all modern and whatnot. But that was geomorphism, this idea of, and even the first reporter was like a little microphone graphic that just looked like a microphone, right? That's geomorphism. It actually looks like a physical device. Now we don't need that anymore. We don't have that anymore. We have just flat graphics everywhere. Everything is just a flat icon these days. Actually, Nielsen's very upset about it. You can find on the internet this rant about when Microsoft came out with, what was it, Windows 10 or whenever they decided to do everything flat. And trust me, Nielsen likes it with Bevel because he likes the way a button looks like and the depth that it evokes. And I'm actually with him. Like, if it doesn't look deep, I don't want to push it. But at some point, I think it was also the material design approach from Google that did away with that, right? So we had these new design systems, and they just said, we don't need 3D anymore. We're just going to go with Slack. So now we have a lot of UI elements that are just flat, and we live in, in flat band. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of scary for some years to that, because it actually takes, like, we lost a lot of the minimum. Thank you very much. Not quite of of user interface that we used to have, right? And so that's one of the, the tricks that happens here. User control and field is another thing that users want to perform actions, or the users often do actions by mistake, and so you want to let them exit that action. You never want to trap a user. This sometimes happens in menus, and it's in the menu, or it happens very, very, like intentionally in bad design. I don't know if you ever clicked on a bad ad on your phone, some of these non-phone optimized websites, all of a sudden the pop-up goes up and there's no X, or the X is so tiny and you can't find it. You can't really, yeah, I don't want your video, right? And then you're trapped. So that's taking away the user control, taking away the freedom. So that's a big no-no in terms of the uh, heuristic. Consistency and standards. Of course, you want to follow the system standards. You want to follow the platform conventions. You kind of want to know how it all fits together. So this is really key for understanding what you're designing for. So you're designing for a mobile phone, which area of the mobile phone you think to have the most important UI elements? Which area is it here or here? But by bottom or this area? Yeah. 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 So, thumb was uh, on the wall. So this area here is where your thumb has the most action. That's where all your core UI elements should be. And then where's, where's really the back element? Because that's really the like, idea to think about it and then do it. Not get that. Yeah, because then here, you kind of like, hey, you're going to stretch the thumb all the way up. You kind of have to take it off, make it do a true habit, and just say, okay, that's it. So conscious, that's it, conscious thinking about it. Whereas something that I just want to do quickly, I want to slide the rule, right? I want to be really quick for that, with the right thumb. Okay, so that's uh, consistency and standards. So you really want to understand what are the standards for the platform that you're developing for? Error prevention, what is that? Ideally, you want to prevent people from putting in wrong things. You, you see that a lot if you ever apply, I don't know if any one of you had the privilege yet to apply to any government forms from Insert or Shirt or CHR or any of the larger funding agencies. Have you ever done any government form stuff? Unfortunately, the Canadian government has portable forms. If you ever do a web form for the Canadian government, you will see all of these things happening where, oh, it didn't have a save button, or, oh, I clicked forward, and now all of the info I entered on the first part of the form is actually lost and cannot be retrieved. So that's where error prevention comes in. You don't want that to happen. So as soon as you're deleting the user input the data, you want to have an error message, or you want to save it in the back end in a cookie or something like that, right? Recognition rather than recall is the idea that you either want to have elements, UI elements, that make it quite easy to understand what action is happening. If you're thinking about, does anyone actually ever use the text based editor, like Vim or V or et cetera? So for using these things, you actually don't have a user interface. You just need to remember what the shortcuts are. So pretty much you're presented with a blank screen, and then you're supposed to put text in there. And if you don't know what the shortcut is, you can't actually save your document, or you don't actually know how to back this kind of thing. You need to remember the shortcut. Very painful, right? Whereas Word, what does Word do? Microsoft Word? What does it have? One of the biggest celebrations in the user interface design of the last decade. And everyone hated it first, by the way. The ribbon, exactly. The UI ribbon. And what does the ribbon do? You kind of already get an idea. You get an idea of how the title looks like. You can have the fonts in there. It kind of like shows you exactly what you're about to do. It has a visual representation that you just need to recognize. This is the action I want to do. I'm just going to press it because it's big. It's right there. I can understand it. Recognition over recall in that case. So really powerful for UI elements. 
And then flexibility and efficiency of use, right? So another thing that we find in a lot of powerful applications is that yes, we can use them as a novice because they make it easy with all these other items and elements. But when we actually want to get really fast with them, some of them don't allow us to do that. So what does flexibility mean? Often it means you're providing expert users a way to use your application much faster. Shortcuts, other ways, automations. This even goes from, if you think about games, right? Like in games, often we have tutorials at the beginning and we have very guided ramping into a video game. So they teach you everything that's necessary and then they throw you in the deep end. Now you've figured it out and you're just like, okay, now I feel like an expert because I can get better and you find more efficient ways to do things by having new items and so forth. So flexibility and efficiency of use, another really key term of good user interfaces. This is a very, very contested element, aesthetic and minimalist design. Specifically of what I said earlier with everything turning into flat. And again, Nielsen's actually said, maybe I should take it out of my heuristic <laughs> because people are over adhering to this heuristic these days. Everything is minimalist, everything is aesthetic. How can you even tell if one thing is more aesthetic than the other? Because we are so minimal at this point, we can't tell. Right, so this is kind of take it with a grain of salt. But most apps are doing is unfortunately too much. Recognizing, diagnosing, and recovering from errors is another thing that's super important. So if you've ever input something wrong in a form field or a, a user interface, what do you want the thing to do? Like, okay, so back in the day, before Google, probably before you're born, when we had the first search engines, and we typed something in there, and we didn't type it properly because not all of that sample word syntax always like proper as we do, it wouldn't actually find the thing. Apple. Fitter. Okay, it doesn't find an Apple Fitter, it finds something other than that. I wanted to type an Apple Fritter, right? And it should just know that I wanted to type Apple Fritter, I just put up the R. Okay, what does Google do? What we call forgiving design. Google forgives you because Google automatically assumes you're living in Waterloo, you're probably looking for Apple Fritters. Oh, okay, cool. I'm searching, I'm going to just search for the Apple Fritters, you tell me if that's okay with you. So that's the, the new design of search engines. We have to just find the thing that it assumes is most relevant for you. Because back in the day, if you didn't actually know specifically how to search for the thing, you just wouldn't find it. So that was, you know, much more difficult. So in terms of design, recognizing, diagnosing, and recovering from errors is a part of that, and not giving error codes, right? Like being very explicit about the, the problem that is happening, and then help and documentation, having ways to find more documentation about the thing that you that you're working with. It used to be packaged with the application or solution. These days, a lot of the times, it's just a web link and it leads to a wiki. Or if you're super hip in a startup, probably to a Notion page where everything's just updated and by the day. And you can just look up all the solutions there. The nice thing of these repositories is that they usually have a search function built in. So you can actually search a lot of the stuff really quickly. Okay, that's it. That's kind of the, the benefits and the everything about Nielsen's heuristics and some of the benefits of being a UX designer. And we're still leaving early. Great. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Please let us know if you got any questions. I look forward to seeing you again next week.